Chapters nine, ten, and eleven of the Right Away by Gilbert Parker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter nine: Old Debts for New. Joe Portugay was breaking the law of the river. He was running a little raft down the stream at night instead of tying up at sundown and camping on the shore or sitting snugly over cooking pot by the little wooden caboose on his raft but defiance of custom and tradition was a habit with joe portugais he had lived in his own way many a year and he was likely to do so till the end though he was a young man yet he had many professions or rather many gifts which he practised as it pleased him he was river driver woodsman hunter carpenter guide as whim or opportunity came to him. On the evening when Charlie Steele met with his mishap he was a river driver, or so it seemed. He had been up northwest a hundred and fifty miles, and he had to come downstream alone with his raft, which in the usual course should take two men to guide it, through slides over rapids and in strong currents. Defying the code of the river with only one small light at the rear of his raft, he voyaged the swift current towards his home, which, when he arrived opposite the Côte d'Orion, was still a hundred miles below. He had watched the lights in the river-drivers' camps, had seen the men beside the fires, and had drifted on with no temptation to join in the songs floating out over the dark water, to share the contents of the jugs raised to boisterous lips, or to thrust his hand into the greasy cooking-pot for a succulent bone. He drifted on until he came opposite Charlemagne's tavern. Here the current carried him inshore. He saw the dim light, he saw dark figures in the barroom, he even got a glimpse of Suzanne Charlemagne. He dropped the house behind quickly but looked back, leaning on the oar and thinking how swift was the rush of the current past the tavern. His eyes were on the tavern door and the light shining through it. Suddenly the light disappeared and the door vanished into darkness. He heard a scuffle and then a heavy splash. "'There's trouble there,' said Joe Portugais, straining his eyes through the night for a kind of low roar dwindling to a loud whispering, and then a noise of hurrying feet came down the stream, and he could dimly see dark figures running away into the night by different paths. "'Some dirty work, very sure,' said Joe Portugais, and his eyes travelled back over the dark water like a lynx's, for the splash was in his ear and a sort of prescience possessed him. He could not stop his raft. It must go on down the current, or be swerved to the shore to be fastened. "'God knows it had an ugly sound,' said Joe Portugay, and again strained his eyes and ears. He shifted his position and took another oar, where the raft lantern might not throw a reflection upon the water. He saw a light shine again through the tavern doorway, then a dark object blocked the light, and a head thrust forward towards the river as though listening. At this moment he fancied he saw something in the water nearing him. He stretched his neck. Yes, there was something. It's a man, God save us, was it murder? said Joe Portugay, and shuddered. Was it murder? The body moved more swiftly than the raft. There was a hand thrust up, two hands. He's alive, said Joe Portugay, and hurriedly pulling round his waist a rope tied to a timber, jumped into the water. Three minutes later, on the raft, he was examining a wound in the head of an insensible man. As his hand wandered over the body towards the heart, it touched something that rattled against a button. He picked it up mechanically and held it to the light. It was an eyeglass. "'My God!' said Joe Portugay, and peered into the man's face. "'It's him!' Then he remembered the last words the man had spoken to him. "'Get out of my sight. You're as guilty as hell but his heart yearned towards the man nevertheless. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Way In and the Way Out In his own world of the parish of Chaudier, Joe Portugais was counted a widely travelled man. He had adventured freely on the great rivers and in the forest, and had journeyed up towards Hudson's Bay further than any man in seven parishes. Joe's father and mother had both died in one year, when he was twenty-five. That year had turned him from a clean-shaven, cheerful boy into a morose-bearded man who looked forty, for it had been marked by his disappearance from Chaudier and his return at the end of it to find his mother dead 
and his father dying broken-hearted. What had driven Joe from home only his father knew. What had happened to him during that year only Joe himself knew, and he told no one, not even his dying father. A mystery surrounded him, and no one pierced it. He was a figure apart in Chaudier Parish. A dreadful memory that haunted him carried him out of the village which clustered round the parish church, into Vadrome Mountain three miles away, where he lived apart from all his kind. It was here he brought the man with the eyeglass one early dawn, after two nights and two days on the river, pulling him up the long hill in a low cart with his strong, faithful dogs, hitching himself with them and toiling upwards through the dark. In his three-roomed hut he laid his charge down upon a pile of bearskins and tended him with a strange gentleness, bathing the wound in the head and binding it again and again. The next morning the sick man opened his eyes heavily. He then began fumbling mechanically on his breast. At last his fingers found his monocle. He feebly put it to his eye and looked at Joe in a strange, questioning, uncomprehending way. "'I beg your pardon,' he said haltingly. "'Have I ever been intro?' Suddenly his eyes closed, a frown gathered on his forehead. After a minute his eyes opened again, and he gazed with painful pathetic seriousness at Joe. This grew to a kind of childish terror. Then slowly, as a shadow passes, the perplexity, anxiety, and terror cleared away and left his forehead calm, his eyes unvexed and peaceful. The monocle dropped, and he did not heed it. At length he said wearily, and with an incredibly simple dependence, I am thirsty now. Joe lifted a wooden bowl to his lips, and he drank, drank, and drank to repletion. When he had finished, he patted Joe's shoulder. I am always thirsty, he said. I shall be hungry, too. I always am. Joe brought him some milk and bread in a bowl. When the sick man had eaten and drunk the bowlful to the last drop and crumb, he lay back with a sigh of content, but trembling from weakness and the strain, though Joe's hand had been under his head, and he had been fed like a little child. All day he lay and watched Joe as he worked, as he came and went. Sometimes he put his hand to his head and said to Joe, It hurts. Then Joe would cool the wound with fresh water from the mountain spring, and he would drag down the bowl to drink from it greedily. It was as though he could never get enough water to drink. So the first day in the hut at Vadrome Mountain passed without questioning on the part of either Charlie Steele or his host. With good reason. Joe Portugais saw that memory was gone, that the past was blotted out. He had watched that first terrible struggle of memory to reassert itself as the eyes mechanically looked out upon new and strange surroundings, but it was only the automatic habit of the sight, fumbling of the blind soul and itself fumbling for the latch which it could not find, for the door which would not open. The first day on the raft, as Charlie had opened his eyes upon the world again after that awful night at the Côte d'Orion, Joe had seen that same blank uncomprehending look, as it were, the first look of a mind upon the world. This time he saw and understood what he saw, and spoke as men speak, but with no knowledge or memory behind it, only the involuntary action of muscle and mind repeated from the vanished past. Charlie Steele was as a little child, and having no past, and comprehending in the present only its limited physical needs and motions, he had no hope, no future no understanding. In three days he was upon his feet, and in four he walked out of doors and followed Joe into the woods and watched him fell a tree and do a woodsman's work. Indoors he regarded all Joe did with eager interest and a pleased complacent look, and readily did as he was told. He seldom spoke, not above three or four times a day, and then simply and directly and only concerning his wants. From first to last, he never asked a question, and there was never any inquiry by look or word. A hundred and twenty miles lay between him and his old home, between him and Kathleen and Billy and Jean Jacqueler's saloon, but between him and his past life the unending miles of eternity intervened. He was removed from it as completely as though he were dead and buried. A month went by. Sometimes Joe went to the village below, 
and then at first he locked the door of the house behind him upon charlie against this charlie made no motion and said no word but patiently awaited joe's return so it was that at last joe made no attempt to lock the door but with a nod or a good-bye left him alone when charlie saw him returning he would go to meet him and shake hands with him and say good day and then would come in with him and help him get supper or do the work of the house since charlie came no one had visited the house for there were no paths beyond it and no one came to the vadrone mountain save by chance but after two months had gone the cure came twice a year the cure made it a point to visit joe in the interest of his soul though the visits came to little for joe never went to confession and seldom to mass on this occasion the cure arrived when joe was out in the woods he discovered charlie charlie made no answer to his astonished and friendly greeting but watched him with a wide-eyed anxiety till the cure seated himself at the door to await joe's coming presently as he sat there charlie who had studied his face as a child studies the unfamiliar face of a stranger brought him a bowl of bread and milk and put it in his hands the cure smiled and thanked him and charlie smiled in return and said it is very good as the cure ate charlie watched him with satisfaction and nodded at him kindly when joe came he lied to the cure he said he found charlie wandering in the woods with a wound in his head and had brought him home with him and cared for him forty miles away he had found him the cure was perplexed what was there to do he believed what joe said so far as he knew joe had never lied to him before and he thought he understood joe's interest in this man with the look of a child and no memory joe's life was terribly lonely he had no one to care for and no one cared for him here was what might comfort him through this helpless man might come a way to joe's own good so he argued with himself what to do tell the story to the world by writing to the newspaper at quebec joe pooh poohed this wait till the man's memory came back would it come back what chance was there of its ever coming back joe said that they ought to wait and see wait a while and then if his memory did not return they would try to find his friends by publishing his story abroad chaudiere was far from anywhere it knew little of the world and the world knew naught of it and this was a large problem for the cure perhaps joe was right he thought the man was being well cared for and what more could be wished at the moment the cure was a simple man and when joe urged that if the sick man could get well anywhere in the world it would be at padrome mountain in chaudiere the cure's parochial guide was roused and he was ready to believe all joe said he also saw reason in joe's request that the village should not be told of the sick man's presence before he left the cure knelt down and prayed for the good of this poor mortal's soul and body as he prayed charlie knelt down also and kept his eyes calm unwondering eyes full fixed on the good m loiselle whose gray hair thin peaceful face and dark brown eyes made a noble picture of patience and devotion when the cure shook him by the hand murmuring in good-bye god be gracious to thee my son charlie nodded in a friendly way he watched the departing figure till it disappeared over the crest of the hill this day marked an epoch in the solitude of the hut on vadrome mountain joe had an inspiration he got a second set of carpenter's tools and straightway began to build a new room to the house he gave the extra set of tools to charlie with an encouraging word for the first time since he had been brought here charlie's face took on a look of interest in half an hour he was at work smiling and perspiring and quickly learning the craft he seldom spoke but he sometimes laughed a mirthful natural boy's laugh of good spirits and contentment from that day his interest in things increased and before two months went round while yet it was late autumn he looked in perfect health he ate moderately drank a great deal of water and slept half the circle of the clock each day his skin was like silk the color of his face was as that of an apple he was more than ever beauty steel the cure came two or three times and charlie spoke to him but never held conversation and no word concerning the past ever passed his tongue 
nor did he have memory of what was said to him from one day to the next. A hundred ways Joe had tried to rouse his memory, but the words Côté d'Orion had no meaning to him, and he listened blankly to all names and phrases once so familiar. Yet he spoke French and English in a slow, passive, involuntary way. All was automatic, mechanical. The weeks again wore on, and autumn became winter, and then at last one day the curé came, bringing his brother, a great Parisian surgeon lately arrived from France on a short visit. The curé had told his brother the story, and had been met by a keen, astonished interest in the unknown man on Vadrome Mountain. A slight pressure on the brain from accident had before now produced loss of memory. The great man's professional curiosity was aroused. He saw a nice piece of surgical work ready to his hand. He asked to be taken to Vadrome Mountain. Now the curé had lived long out of the world, and was not in touch with the swift-minded action and adventuring intellects of such men as his brother Marcel Loisel. Was it not tempting providence a surgical operation? He was so used to people getting ill and getting well without a doctor, the nearest was twenty miles distant, or getting ill and dying in what seemed a natural and preordained way, that to cut open a man's head and look into his brain and do this or that to his skull seemed almost sinful. Was it not better to wait and see if the poor man would not recover at God's appointed time? In answer to his sensitively eager and diverse questions, Marcel Loisel replied that his dear curé was merely medieval, and that he had sacrificed his mental powers on the altar of a simple faith, which might remove mountains but was of no value in a case like this, where, clearly, surgery was the only providence. At this the curé got to his feet, came over, laid his hand on his brother's shoulder, and said with tears in his eyes, "'Marcel, you shock me. Indeed, you shock me.' Then he twisted a knot in his cassock cords and added, "'Come then, Marcel, we will go to him, and may God guide us aright.' That afternoon the two grey-haired men visited Vadrome Mountain, and there they found Charlie at work in the little room that the two men had built. Charlie nodded pleasantly when the curé introduced his brother, but showed no further interest at first. He went on working at the cupboard under his hand. His cap was off, and his hair was a little rumpled where the wound had been, for he had a habit of rubbing the place now and then, an abstracted, sensitive motion, although he seemed to suffer no pain. The surgeon's eyes fastened on the place, and as Charlie worked and his brother talked, he studied the man, the scar, the contour of the head. At last he came up to Charlie and softly placed his fingers on the scar, feeling the skull. Charlie turned quickly. There was something in the long, piercing look of the surgeon which seemed to come through limitless space to the sleeping and imprisoned memory of Charlie's sick mind. A confused, anxious, half-fearful look crept into the wide blue eyes. It was like a troubled ghost flitting along the boundaries of sight and sense, and leaving a chill and a horrified wonder behind. The surgeon gazed on, and the trouble in Charlie's eye passed to his face, stayed an instant. Then he turned away to Joe Portugais. "'I am thirsty now,' he said, and he touched his lips in the way he had wont to do in those countless ages ago, when millions upon millions of miles away people said, "'There goes Charlie Steele.' "'I am thirsty now,' and that touch of the lip of the tongue was a revelation to the surgeon. A half-hour later he was walking homeward with the curé. Joe accompanied them for a distance. As they emerged into the wider road pass that began halfway down the mountain, the curé, who had watched his brother's face for a long time in silence, said, "'What is in your mind, Marcel?' The surgeon turned with a half-smile. "'He is happy now. No memory, no conscience, no pain, no responsibility, no trouble, nothing behind or before. Is it good to bring him back?' The curé had thought it all over and he had wholly changed his mind since that first talk with his brother. "'To save a mind, Marcel,' he said. "'Then to save a soul,' suggested the surgeon. "'Would he thank me? It is our duty to save him. Body and mind and soul, eh? And if I look after the body and the mind? His soul is in God's hands, Marcel. But will he thank me? How can you tell what sorrows, what troubles he has had, what struggles, temptations, sins?' He has none now of any sort, not a stain, physical or moral. 
that is not life marcel well well you have changed this morning it was i who would and you hesitated i see differently now marcel the surgeon put a hand playfully on his brother's shoulders did you think my dear prosper that i should hesitate am i a sentimentalist but what will he say we need not think of that marcel but yet suppose that with memory come again sin and shame even crime we will pray for him but if he isn't a catholic one must pray for sinners said the cure after a silence this time the surgeon laid a hand on the shoulder of his brother affectionately upon my soul dear prosper you almost persuade me to be reactionary and medieval the cure turned half uneasily towards joe who was following at a little distance this seemed hardly the sort of thing for him to hear you had better return now joe he said as you wish monsieur joe answered then looked inquiringly at the surgeon in about five days portugais have you a steady hand and a quick eye joe spread out his hands in deprecation and turned to the cure as though for him to answer joe is something of a physician and surgeon too marcel he has a gift he has cured many in the parish with his herbs and tinctures and he has set legs and arms successfully the surgeon eyed joe humorously but kindly he is probably as good a doctor as some of us medicine is a gift surgery is a gift and an art you shall hear from me portugais he looked again keenly at joe you have not given him herbs and tinctures nothing monsieur very sensible good day portugais good day my son said the priest and raised his fingers in benediction as joe turned and quickly retraced his steps why did you ask him if he had given the poor man any herbs or tinctures marcel said the priest because those quack tinctures have whiskey in them what do you mean whiskey in any form would be bad for him the surgeon answered evasively but to himself he kept saying the man was a drunkard he was a drunkard End of chapter ten chapter eleven the raising of the curtain M. Marcel Loisel did his work with a masterly precision, with the aid of his brother and Portugais. The man under the instruments, not wholly insensible, groaned once or twice. Once or twice, too, his eyes opened with a dumb, hunted look, then closed as with an irresistible weariness. When the work was over, and every stain or sign of surgery removed, sleep came down on the bed, a deep and saturating sleep which seemed to fill the room with peace. For hours the surgeon sat beside the couch, now and again feeling the pulse, wetting the hot lips, touching the forehead with his palm. At last, with a look of satisfaction, he came forward to where Joe and the curé sat beside the fire. "'It is all right,' he said. "'Let him sleep as long as he will.' He turned again to the bed. "'I wish I could stay to see the end of it. Is there no chance, Prosper?' he added to the priest. "'Impossible, Marcel. You must have sleep.' you have a seventy-mile drive before you to-morrow and sixty the next day you can only reach the port now by starting at daylight to-morrow so it was that marcel loisel the great surgeon was compelled to leave chaudiere before he knew that the memory of the man who had been under his knife had actually returned to him he had however no doubt in his own mind and he was confident that there could be no physical harm from the operation sleep was the all-important thing in it lay the strength for the shock of the awakening if awakening of memory there was to be before he left he stooped over charlie and said musingly i wonder what you will wake up to my friend then he touched the wound with a light caressing finger it was well done well done he murmured proudly a moment afterwards he was hurrying down the hill to the open road where a carriole awaited the cure and himself for a day and a half Charlie slept, and Joe watched him with an affectionate solicitude, once or twice becoming anxious because of the heavy breathing and the motionless sleep he had forced open the teeth and poured a little broth between. Just before dawn on the second morning, worn out and heavy with slumber, Joe lay down by a piled-up fire and dropped into a sleep that wrapped him like a blanket, folding him away into a drenching darkness. For a time there was a deep silence, troubled only by Joe's deep breathing, which seemed itself like the pulse of the silence. 
Charlie appeared not to be breathing at all. He was lying on his back, seemingly lifeless. Suddenly on the snug silence there was a sharp sound. A tree outside snapped with the frost. Charlie awoke. The body seemed not to awake, for it did not stir. But the eyes opened wide and full, looking straight before them, straight up to the brown smoke-stained rafters, along which were ranged guns and fishing tackle, axes and bear traps. Full, clear blue eyes, healthy and untired as a child's fresh from an all-night drowse, they looked and looked. Yet at first the body did not stir. Only the mind seemed to be awakening, the soul creeping out from slumber into the day. Presently, however, as the eyes gazed, there stole into them a wonder, a trouble, an anxiety. For a moment they strained at the rafters and the crude weapons and implements there. Then the body moved quickly, eagerly, and turned to see the flickering shadows made by the fire and the simple order of the room. A minute more, and Charlie was sitting on the side of his couch, dazed and staring. This hut, this fire, the figure by the hearth in a sound sleep. His hand went to his head. It felt the bandage there. He remembered now. Last night at the Côte d'Orion. Last night he had talked with Suzanne Charlemagne at the Côte d'Orion. Last night he had drunk harder than he had ever drunk in his life. He had defied, chaffed, insulted the river drivers. The whole scene came back. The faces of Suzanne and her father, Suzanne's fingers on his for an instant, the glass of brandy beside him, the lanterns on the walls, the hymn he sang, the sermon he preached. He shuddered a little. The rumble of angry noises round him, the tumbler thrown, the crash of the lantern, and only one light left in the place. Then Jake Ho in his heavy hand, the flying monocle, and his disdainful insulting reply the sight of the pistol in the hand of Suzanne's father, then a rush, a darkness, and his own fierce plunge towards the door, beyond which were the stars and the cool night and the dark river. Curses, hands that battered and tore at him, the doorway reached, and then a blow on the head, and falling, 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 and distant noises growing more distant, and suddenly and sweetly absolute silence. Again he shuddered. Why? He remembered that scene in his office yesterday with Kathleen, and the one later with Billy. A sensitive chill swept all over him, making his flesh creep, and a flush spread over his face from chin to brow. Today he must pick up all these threads again, must make things right for Billy, must replace the money he had stolen, must face Kathleen again, he shuddered. Was he at the Cote Dorian still? He looked round him. No, this was not the sort of house to be found at the Côte d'Orion. Clearly this was the hunt of a hunter. Probably he had been fished out of the river by this woodsman and brought here. He felt his head. The wound was fresh and very sore. He had played for death with an insulting disdain, yet here he was alive. Certainly he was not intended to be drowned or knifed. He remembered the knives he saw unsheathed or kicked or pummeled into the hereafter. It was about ten o'clock when he had had his accident. He affected a smile, yet somehow he did not smile easily. It must be now about five, for here was the morning creeping in behind the deerskin blind at the window. Strange that he felt none the worse for his mishap, and his tongue was as clean and fresh as if he had been drinking milk last night, and not very doubtful brandy at the Côte d'Orion. No fever in his hands, no headache only the sore skull, so well and tightly bandaged, but a wonderful thirst and an intolerable hunger. He smiled. When had he ever been hungry for breakfast before? Here he was with a fine appetite. It was like coals of fire heaped on his head by nature for last night's business at the Côte d'Orion. How true it was that penalties did not always come with indiscretions. Yet all at once he flushed again to the forehead, for a curious sense of shame flashed through his whole being, and one Charlie Steele, the Charlie Steele of this morning, an unknown, unadventuring, onlooking Charlie Steele, was viewing with abashed eyes the Charlie Steele who had ended a doubtful career in the coarse and desperate proceedings of last night. With a nervous confusion he sought refuge in his eyeglass. His fingers fumbled over his waistcoat, but did not find it. 
the weapon of defense and attack, the symbol of interrogation and incomprehensibility, was gone. Beauty Steele was under the eyes of another self, and neither disdain nor contempt nor the passive stare were available. He got suddenly to his feet and started forward as though to find refuge from himself. The abrupt action sent the blood to his head, and feeling a blindness come over him, he put both hands up to his temples and sank back on the couch, dizzy and faint. His motions waked Joe Portugay, who scrambled from the floor and came towards him. "'Monsieur,' he said, "'you must not. You are faint.' He dropped his hand supportingly to Charlie's shoulders. Charlie nodded, but did not yet look up. His head throbbed sorely. "'Water, please,' he said. In an instant Joe was beside him again, with a bowl of fresh water at his lips. He drank, 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 until the great bowl was drained to the last drop. "'Whew, that was good,' he said, and looked up at Joe with a smile. "'Thank you, my friend. I haven't the honor of your acquaintance, but—' He stopped suddenly and stared at Joe. Inquiry, mystification were in his look. "'Have I ever seen you before?' he said. "'Who knows, monsieur?' Since Joe had stood before Charlie in the dock nearly six years ago, he had greatly changed. The marks of smallpox, a heavy beard, gray hair, and solitary life had altered him beyond Charlie's recognition. Joe could hardly speak. His legs were trembling under him, for now he knew that Charlie Steele was himself again. He was no longer the simple, quiet man-child of three days ago and of these months past, but the man who had saved him from hanging to whom he owed a debt he dare not acknowledge. Joe's brain was in a muddle. Now that the great crisis was over, now that the expected thing had come, and face to face with the cure, he had neither tongue nor strength nor wit. His words stuck in his throat where his heart was, and for a minute his eyes had a kind of mist before them. Meanwhile Charlie's eyes were upon him, curious, fixed, abstracted. "'Is this your house?' "'It is, monsieur. You fished me out of the river by the Côte d'Orient?' He still held his head with his hands, for it throbbed so, but his eyes were intent on his companion. "'Yes, monsieur.' Charlie's hand mechanically fumbled for his monocle. Joe turned quickly to the wall, and taking it by its cord from the nail where it had been for these long months, handed it over. Charlie took it and mechanically put it in his eye. "'Thank you, my friend,' he said. "'Have I been conscious at all since you rescued me last night?' he asked. "'In a way, monsieur.' "'Ah, well, I can't remember, but it was very kind of you. I do thank you very much. Do you think you could find me something to eat? I beg your pardon, it isn't breakfast time, of course, but I was never so hungry in my life.' "'In a minute, monsieur, in one minute. But lie down, you must lie down a little. You got up too quick, and it makes your head throb. You have had nothing to eat.' "'Nothing since yesterday noon, and very little, then. I didn't eat anything at the Côte d'Orient, I remember.' He lay back on the couch and closed his eyes. The throbbing in his head presently stopped, and he felt that if he ate something he could go to sleep again. It was so restful in this place. A whole day's sleep and rest, how good it would be after last night's racketing. Here was primitive and material comfort, the secret of content, if you like. Here was this poor hunter-fellow with enough to eat and to drink, earning it every day by every day's labor, and like Robinson Crusoe, no doubt, living in a serene self-sufficiency and an Elysian retirement. Probably he had no responsibilities in the world, with no one to say him nay, himself only to consider in all the universe, a divine conception of adequate life. Yet himself Charlie Steele, an idler, a waster, with no purpose in life, with scarcely the necessity to earn his bread, never at any rate until lately, was the slave of the civilization to which he belonged. Was civilization worth the gain? His hand involuntarily went to his head. It changed the course of his thoughts. He must go back today to put Billy's crime right, to replace the trust monies Billy had taken by forging his brother-in-law's name not a moment must be lost. No doubt he was within driving distance of his office, and, bandaged head or no bandaged head, last night's nice disgraceful doings notwithstanding, it was his duty to face the wandering eyes. What did he care for wandering eyes? Hadn't he been making eyes wander all his life? 
faced the wandering eyes in the little city and set a crooked business straight. Fool and scoundrel certainly Billy was, but there was Kathleen. His lips tightened. He had a strange, anxious flutter of the heart. When had his heart fluttered like this? When had he ever before considered Kathleen's feelings as to his personal conduct so delicately? Well, since yesterday he did feel it, and a sudden sense of pity sprang up in him, vague, shamefaced pity, which belied the sudden egotistical flourish with which he put his monocle to his eye and tried futilely to smile in the old way. He had lain with his eyes closed. They opened now, and he saw his host spreading a newspaper as a kind of cloth on a small rough table, and putting some food upon it, bread, meat, and a bowl of soup. It was thoughtful of this man to make a soup overnight. He saw Joe lift it from beside the fire, where it had been kept hot. A good fellow, an excellent fellow, this woodsman. His head did not throb now, and he drew himself up slowly on his elbow, then after a moment lifted himself to a sitting posture. "'What is your name, my friend?' he said. "'Joe Portugais, monsieur,' Joe answered, and brought a candle and put it on the table then lifted the tin plate from over the bowl of savory soup. Never before had Charlie Steele sat down to such a breakfast. A roll and a cup of coffee had been enough, and often too much for him. Yet now he could not wait to eat the soup with a spoon, but lifted the bowl and took a long draught of it, and set it down with a sigh of content. Then he broke bread into the soup, large pieces of black oat bread, until the bowl was a mass of luscious pulp. This he ate almost ravenously, his eye wandering avidly the while to the small piece of meat beside the bowl. What meat was it? It looked like venison, yet summer was not the time for venison. What did it matter? Joe sat on a bench beside the fire, his face turned towards his guest, dreading the moment when the man he had nursed and cared for, with whom he had eaten and drunk for so long, should know the truth about himself. He could not tell him all there was to tell he was taking another means of letting him know. Charlie did not speak. Hunger was a new sensation, a delicious thing, too good to be broken by talking. He ate till he had cleared away the last crumbs of bread and meat, and drunk the last drop of soup. He looked at the woodsman as though wondering if he would bring more. Joe evidently thought he had had enough, for he did not move. Charlie's glance withdrew from Joe, and busied itself with the few crumbs remaining upon the table. He saw a little piece of bread on the floor. He picked it up and ate it with relish, laughing to himself. "'How long will it take us to get to town? Can we do it this morning?' "'Not this morning, monsieur,' said Joe, in a sort of hoarse whisper. "'How many hours would it take?' He was gathering the last crumbs of his feast with his hand, and looking casually down at the newspaper spread as a tablecloth. All at once his hand stopped, his eyes became fixed on a spot in the paper. He gave a hoarse, guttural cry like an animal in agony. His lips became dry, his hand wiped a blinding mist from his eyes. Joe watched him with an intense alarm and a horrified curiosity. He felt a base coward for not having told Charlie what this paper contained. Never had he seen such a look as this. He felt his beads and told them over and over again as Charlie Steele in a dry, croaking sort of whisper, read, in letters that seemed monstrous symbols of fire, a record of himself. Today, by special license, from the civil and ecclesiastical courts, the paragraph in the paper began, was married at St. Theobald's Church, Mrs. Charles Steele, daughter of the late Honorable Julian Wantage, a niece of the late Eustace Wantage, Esquire, to Captain Thomas Faring, of the Royal Fusiliers. Charlie snatched at the top of the paper and read the date, 10th of February, 18. It was August when he was at the Côte d'Orion, the 5th August, 18, and this paper was February 10th, 18. He read on. In the month-old paper, with every nerve in his body throbbing now, a fierce beating that seemed as if it must burst his heart and the veins. Captain Thomas Faring of the Royal Fusiliers, whose career in our midst has been marked by an honorable sense of public and private duty. Our fellow citizens will unite with us in congratulating the bride, whose previous misfortunes have only increased the respect in which she is held. If all remember the obscure death of her first husband, though the body was not found, there has never been a doubt of his death, 
and the subsequent discovery that he had embezzled trust monies to the extent of twenty five thousand dollars thereby setting the final seal of shame upon a misspent life destined for brilliant and powerful uses all have conspired to forget the association of our beautiful and admired townswoman with his career it is painful to refer to these circumstances but it is only within the past few days that the estate of the misguided man has been wound up and the money he embezzled restored to its rightful owners and it is better to make these remarks now than to repeat them in the future only to arouse painful memories in quarters where we should least desire to wound in her new life blessed by a romantic devotion known and admired by all mrs fairing and her husband will be followed by the affectionate good wishes of the whole community the man on the hearthstone shrank back at the sight of the still white face in which the eyes were like sparks of fire his impulse had been to go over and offer the hand of sympathy to the stricken man but his simple mind grasped the fact that no one might with impunity invade this awful quiet charlie was frozen in body but his brain was awake with the heat of a burning fiery furnace seven months of unconscious life seven months of silence no sight no seeing no knowing seven months of oblivion in which the world had buried him out of ken in an unknown grave of infamy seven months and kathleen was married again to the man she had always loved to the world he himself was a rogue and thief billy had remained silent billy whom he had so befriended had let decent men heap scorn and reproaches on his memory here was what the world thought of him he read the lines over again his eyes scorching but his fingers steady as it traced the lines slowly the obscure death embezzled trust monies the final seal of shame upon a misspent life these were the epitaphs on the tombstone of charlie steele dead and buried out of sight out of repute soon to be out of mind and out of memory save as a warning to others an old example raked out of the dustbin of time by the scavengers of morality to toss at all who trod the paths of dalliance what was there to do go back go back and knock at kathleen's door another enoch arden and say i have come to be my own again return and tell tom fairing to go his way and show his face no more break up this union this marriage of love in which these two rejoiced summon kathleen out of her illegal intercourse with the man who had been true to her all these years to what end what had he ever done for her that he might destroy her now what sort of spartan tragedy was this that the woman who had been the victim of circumstances who had been the slave to a tie he never felt yet which he had been as iron bound to her should now be brought out to be mangled body and soul for no fault of her own what had she done what had she ever done to give him right to touch so much as a hair of her head go back and bring billy to justice and clear his own name go back and send kathleen's brother the forger to jail what an achievement in justice would not the world have a right to say that the only decent thing he could do was to eliminate himself from the equation what profit for him in the great summing up that he was technically innocent of this one thing and that to establish his innocence he broke a woman's heart and destroyed a boy's life to what end it was the murderer coming back as a ghost to avenge himself for being hanged suppose he went back the death's head at the feast what would there be for him afterwards for any one for whom he was responsible living at that price to die and end it all to disappear from this petty life where he had done so little and that little ill to die no there was in him some deep if obscure fatalism after all if he had been meant to die now why had he not gone to the bottom of the river that yesterday at de cote dorian why had he been saved by this yokel at the fire and brought here to lie in oblivion in this mountain hut wrapped in silence and lost to the world why had his brain and senses lain fallow all these months a vacuous vegetation an empty consciousness was it fate did it not seem probable that the great machine had in his automatic movement tossed him up again on the shores of time because he had not fallen on the trap-door 
predestined for his external exit? It was clear to him that death by his own hand was futile, and that if there were trapdoors set for him alone it were well to wait until he trod upon them and fell through in his appointed hour in the movement of the great machine. What to do, where to live, how to live? He got slowly to his feet and took a step forward half-blindly. The man on the bench stirred. Crossing the room, he dropped a hand on the man's shoulder. "'Open the blind, my friend.' Joe Portugais got to his feet quickly, eyes averted. He did not dare look into Charlie's face, and went over and drew back the deerskin blind. The clear, crisp sunlight of a frosty morning broke gladly into the room. Charlie turned and blew out the candle on the table where he had eaten, then walked feebly to the window. Standing on the crest of the mountain the hut looked down through a clearing flanked by forest trees. It was a goodly scene. The green and frosted foliage of the pines and cedars, the flowery tracery of frost hanging like cobwebs everywhere, the powdery sparkle in the air, the hills of silver and emerald sloping down to the valley miles away, where the village clustered about the great old parish church, the smoke from a hundred chimneys in purple spirals rising straight up in the windless air, over all peace and a perfect silence. Charlie mechanically fixed his eyeglass and stood with hands resting on the window sill, looking, looking out upon a new world. At length he turned. "'Is there anything I can do for you, monsieur?' said Joe huskily. Charlie held out his hand and clasped Joe's. "'Tell me about all these months,' he said. End of chapter 11 Recording by Tom Weiss TomsAudiobooks.com